Hello, everybody. My name is Jenny Stenberg Isiren, and I'm presently working as a postdoc in the Swedish Literature Society in Finland. But from September on, I will be a senior lecturer in journalism at the University of Helsinki. I also have a background in journalism. I worked for about 15 years in the Finnish broadcasting company YLE before switching into academia where I have been mostly doing research on media and language from different perspectives. Today, uh, I will be talking about um, should we be adding who to the what and the why? Reflections on ethic and emic perspectives on media and language research. Let me just share my screen with you. Okay, you should be seeing it now. Uh, the aim for this presentation is not to report on specific results from a, a research project, but more to, to reflect on the, my previous research and the ethic and emic perspectives on that research. Um, I will strongly uh, rely on the new article by Hapanen and Manninen, which probably a lot of you have read. Uh, and this is kind of a comment to, to that article. Uh, my questions are, uh, what do the different perspectives, ethic uh, academic perspectives add? How does, does the choice of perspectives reflect on the results? And how should we count for the ethicness and emicness of the researcher? You probably all know a lot about ethic and emic perspectives, but I thought I would just briefly go through some definitions so that we are on the same page here. Uh, Kenneth L. Pike was the one defining the concepts and according to him, uh, ethic viewpoints are studies done from the outside of a system, whereas emic studies are done from the inside with criteria chosen from within the system. Ethic refers to a researcher's analyst's outsider perspective and emic to a practitioner informant's insider perspective. This is how Hapanen and Manninen concludes their discussion about the concepts while also uh, discussing how many different interpretations there are uh, in different fields and, and um, that these concepts are quite hard sometimes to, to handle. They also go on by concluding that ethic refers to data that are descriptive and can reliably be produced even by someone with limited contextual understanding. Emic in turn refers to data that are explanatory and that refer to the meanings participants themselves attach to their experience. So here we already have three, three levels of, of uh, definitions. We have the viewpoints, we have the actors, the researchers and the informants, and we have different types of data. We'll return to this. Um, I will do some reflection on my own studies, as I mentioned, uh, three different studies, all concerning media and language in some way, but at the same time, very different type of studies. First, just a brief introduction to the media landscape. Um, all my studies are about the Swedish media in Finland, and uh, Swedish is a national language in Finland, but it's spoken by a minority. So it's not in a legal sense a minority language, but in practice it, it is. Um, Swedish is naturally spoken also in Sweden, uh, so Swedish is a pluricentric language. And uh, the, vari the variety spoken in Finland, Finland Swedish, uh, can consider it to be a non dominant variety. The media landscape uh, in Finland in, is quite rich. And this, if, it, if we're thinking about uh, Swedish language media, we have the public service media company, YLE, with two radio stations and one television channel and uh, seven daily newspapers, as well as uh, several others, smaller ones. So considering the size of the language group, we have a lot of media uh, outlets. Okay, so the first study uh, is a study about language choices in media use among young Swedish-speaking Finns. 
uh, here we have, it's kind of an audience study um, based on how they use languages and with, in what languages they consume and use uh, media. Uh, there are three different studies in this package. Uh, first, a statistical analysis of a questionnaire that was sent to 800 adolescents. Um, that was followed by qualitative interviews with 26, 26 adolescents. And finally, a second questionnaire follow-up study two years later to uh, almost 550 respondents. And the results, just in short, uh, from the questionnaires, uh, we got numbers and percentages on how much they use different languages in different media contexts. Whereas from their interviews, we got answers to in which way they use the languages, with whom and why. When reflecting on this study, um, it's quite easy to see that the questionnaires are eth ethic, whereas uh, the interviews are emic. They bring ethic and emic data. But um, the second questionnaire in particular was definitely influenced by emic perspectives because uh, the interviews done between, in between these two questionnaires gave insights and perspectives that we could use uh, in formulating the questions in the second uh, questionnaire. So we have basically ethic questionnaires with emic perspectives. Kaufmann and Manninen also distinguishes between low, partial and high integration of ethic and emic methods. And in this case, I would say we are on the lower end of the scale, low to partial integration. We have partially the same questions in the different uh, methods, but it's not the same individuals responding. So um, partial or low integration. And the role of the researcher uh, is also mostly ethic in this, in this case. Um, I, as a researcher, belong to the same language group as these uh, adolescents. So in that sense, I do have uh, some insight into how the media landscape might look for them. But on the other hand, I'm in a totally different age group. So in that sense, I'm definitely an outsider. Okay, so consequences for the results from these methods used. I would say that this is a typical example of how ethic perspectives are giving us answers to what, and emic perspectives are giving us the how and why. Uh, we get a much deeper understanding from the interviews, but they would be impossible to generalize if we didn't have the quantitative data. So here they are complementing each other uh, very well. Then we move on to study two, uh, which is a bit more complex. Uh, it's a sociolinguistic study of the spoken standard language in radio and television news and language attitudes of journalists. This was my PhD dissertation. So the methods used here were uh, a phonological analysis of pronunciation features uh, from a period of 40 years. I listened to the radio and television news, transcribed them, and coded those uh, variables that I was interested in studying, uh, 24 if I'm not remembering uh, wrongly. And uh, then I also had a questionnaire to the journalists at working at the time at, at the Swedish section in Wiley. And very, very briefly, uh, the results were that we see a very strong standard language ideology and that the pronunciation is close to the norm. It has been close all the time, but even becoming more standardized and more neutral over time. So we see a sociolinguistic neutralization of the standard language in broadcast news. Then to the point, what do I think about these methods now, looking at them with these ethic, ethic emic uh, glasses? Well, my initial um, impression was that the phonological analysis was ethic. It provided ethic data and the questionnaire emic data. And this is true. However, when I started thinking more about this, I realized that the phonological analysis was also influenced by emic perspectives because I chose the variables uh, based on previous research, but also on uh, pronunciation guidelines that are in use in, in Wiley. And my own experience as working as a journalist 
I knew which features were um, considered important for creating uh, at least the illusion of a very formal qualitative standard language. And I knew uh, which features were discussed and, and important in that sense to the journalists. So I brought as a journalist uh, or as a former journalist, now a researcher, I brought the emic perspectives to this phonological analysis. Uh, and the questionnaire was also uh, mostly emic, but on the other hand, I as a researcher brought ethic perspectives to it by formulating the questions, by giving them alter answer alternatives, even though they could all, they had open-ended uh, open questions also, a, a lot of them actually, but still I provided some ethic um, perspectives to that questionnaire as well. So mostly ethic, mostly emic, but not uh, they're not clear cut um, uh, features here. Considering the integration of the methods, I would say here we have a partial integration of certain phonological features and some journalists that appear in both data sets. But since the phonological analysis, analysis was made for a, during a period of 40 years, of course, not all of the journalists appearing in that were able to answer the, the, the questionnaire. So partial integration, um, but not a total or a high. So the role of the researcher, here I would say uh, we have an emic ethic balance. I have the inside perspective as a former journalist, super journalist working there, but I also bring the ethic approach as a researcher and as a linguist. Consequences for the results, uh, I would say that combining these two perspectives, combining the, the phonological analysis and the questionnaire, uh, the emic perspectives, they complemented each other and they provided a much broader understanding of the language use in new, the new broadcast news compared with if I would have chosen only one of these perspectives. Okay, so the third study. Uh, this is the newest study uh, about media language planning during COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> Here, uh, I did a content analysis of the language recommendations sent to the Swedish media in Finland during 15 months and interviews with the media language advisors. Some of the results are that we see a very close cooperation between the journalists and the language advisors, and we see a high dependence on the media language advice. And we also see that norm authorities were less than usual from Sweden. In this case, more they were more national, and this is quite interesting. But we won't go into that right now. Um, looking at the methods used, I would say that the content analysis per se is quite ethic. I look at it from the outside and and uh, do the analysis analysis from the outside. But it was strongly influenced by the emic perspectives given perspectives given to me through the interviews. Um, and in this case, I would say we see a partial to even high integration of the methods because the language advisors that I interviewed were the ones who had written the, the language recommendations. And we discussed several, uh, several of the recommendations in the interview, and they could provide uh, insights into the process and, and their way of thinking that affected my analysis of the recommendations, the language recommendations. So the consequences for the results were uh, a much more interesting result. Uh, and um, uh, I wouldn't have been able to get that only through the content analysis. The role of the researcher here, I would also say is mostly emic, actually, because I kind of bridge uh, the two fields that they work with. Uh, I'm a former journalist, but I'm also a linguist. So they were able to open up uh, about all the different stages of their process and they spoke very freely. Uh, they also provided me with the language recommendations they had sent to the journalists and um, they took an active part in this. And I think this is due to the fact that I was known to them. I had worked with them before and so forth. Uh, and the involvement of the practitioners here is also interesting. One of them sent me an email afterwards saying that 
this is interesting for us as well to look back and reflect on what we have done and not done during the corona pandemic. So they were very engaged in this project. So some conclusions in, at this point, uh, based on this very small meta study of my own research, I would say that ethic and emic perspectives give a deeper and a broader understanding, and which is also something that Hoffman and Manin concludes. They say that an insider's view often benefits from being supported by ethic data to gain an accurate emic point of view. The opposite also holds the production of ethic data can be informed and guided by emic knowledge. And this is precisely what I also noticed. It is beneficial to let the different approaches build on each other and to improve the methods in use by drawing on results from the different methods. And it's impossible to draw a strict line between ethic and emic. I also realized that. And as Perrin Bellamy says, they should probably be understood as constituting a spectrum, not a dichotomy. Uh, and I agree with this definitely. It's also important to reflect on which insider's perspective uh, is chosen, who gets to be on the inside, and who's meaning, which meanings that participants themselves attach to their experience should we be studying? Are we always choosing the right ones? For example, I'm thinking about the phonolo phonological analysis I did of the pronunciation in the news. Um, if we would want an emic perspective on that, perhaps we should actually be working with the listeners, the ordinary news consumers listening to radio and television news daily, are they the ones actually able to give an emic perspective on uh, how the news sound? That's something to think about. Another thing I noticed was that the more inside perspectives I had, the more involved I was, the higher the integration of the perspectives were. So this is also something to think about, and maybe, maybe, maybe we can discuss this afterwards. Uh, is there a correlation between the emicness of the researcher and the integration of perspectives and the use of emic perspectives? And that leads us to one of the main points. What about the researcher? As Hapanen and Manninen also uh, conclude, uh, or they raise the question, <clears throat> is ethic knowledge not contaminated by the researcher's own emic preconceptions? And the answer to that is, of course, yes, of course it is. We are all influenced by so our social and cultural background, our personalities, and also our, our worldview on research. How should research be done? Which scientific field do we come from? which academic history do we have, and so forth. Anderson, Stewart, and Aziz talk about the researcher's gaze. They want to um, point out how active we, how actively we are looking at uh, the research uh, object that we are studying. It can be compared to framing in journalism, for example. We all look at things from a different perspective, and that influences the results as well. So, this is a given, we can change this. We are all affected by our backgrounds and our context, but we can be conscious about it and we can be open about it. So one important question is, how do researchers uh, show their epicness, emicness or eticness? Maybe epicness as well. And that leads us, of course, to researchers' reflexivity. Um, Etherington uh, concludes that ref reflexivity requires self-awareness, but it's more than self-awareness in that it creates a dynamic process of interaction within and between ourselves and our participants and the data that informs uh, decisions, actions, and interpretations at all stages of research. So reflexivity is something that we should be aware of throughout the research process. A tool to help us do that uh, is given to us by Ruokon and Engler and Siuti, uh, who study um, biographical reflexive journaling in transnational research. But this uh, tool is 
in my opinion, at least uh, fully functional in all disciplines. So we have to think about ourselves in relation to the research topic. What personal experience do I have with my research topic? How did I come to study this? What is my relationship to the topic? How did I gain access to the field? How does my own position influence uh, interaction in the field and the data collection process? And what is my interpretation perspective? So this is a lot to think about, and I think we should be thinking about it. So the final question then, should we apply ethic and emic perspectives on, on all parts of the research process? Now we have mostly been talking about the data uh, gathering methods, but we could also talk about the analysis part more. Uh, Perry and Bellamy draw a parallel between ethic and emic uh, and primary and secondary interpretation primary being the ones that the actors are doing and the secondary interpretation, the ones that the researcher is doing. And both Pike and uh, Perry and Bellamy talk about emic and etic terms and concepts used, emic terms coming from the inside and etic from the outside, brought by the researcher. But we could also look at the very start of the research process, the research questions. Can we formulate better research questions if we bring in pr practitioners and emic perspectives already at that point? Um, can we use citizen science, which is an upcoming field, when we engage non-professionals in the entire research process, perhaps? And also think about uh, the output. What do we do with our results? Uh, are we sharing them with peers like today, or are we, are we also sharing our results with the practitioners, allowing them to comment on them and give input from uh, their perspective, which in turn could lead to um, a new research question, which is already based on emic perspectives. So final thoughts. In order for academic research to support and improve journalistic practices, it is not enough for analysis to describe a process or its output. The research should also explain why things happen as they happen or why the output is as it is, uh, Hoppenen and Manninen says. But research should not only do that, it should also analyze, contextualize, compare, theorize, and so forth, and thereby bring, it is bringing an ethic perspective. So in the end, I'm throwing out a rather provocative question. Is it the ethicness of the researcher that makes it science? That's something for us to discuss. Here are uh, my literature, the literature I used, and this is not showing all too well now, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and he, here are the studies that are, are made by myself that I was uh, reflecting on. Thank you very much. <laughs>